Hello, everyone, and welcome to what is the first episode of Bearded Philosophy. I am Chris. And my name is Matt. And today we are going to be going over Plato's Meno. Now, this is one of Plato's dialogues, which is how he presented a lot of his philosophy. It's a very interesting one, and I think a very appropriate one to be going over in our first episode to kind of introduce us both to what philosophy is after Socrates, who was very influential, and we'll probably get into why in a later episode. But today, we're going to see how he interacts with a visiting traveler to Athens, Menno. I'd like to start by kind of posing a question for you, Matt. Now, in the dialogue, quite a bit happens, uh, kind of starts off with Menno asking uh, Socrates whether or not virtue can be taught. And Socrates pretty quickly turns it around on him and tells him he doesn't even know what virtue is. And can he explain it? Kind of goes on for a while there, him trying to to find out a way to explain that, but doesn't seem to be able to know how. But I really do want to open up with that first question about halfway, maybe a little more through the dialogue, right after the guiding through of the slave boy through this geometrical proposition. You know, Socrates... uh, poses to him and this is right around line 82 e he says and this is to to mino he says do you observe mino that i am not teaching the boy anything but merely asking him each time and now he says i think i don't want to cut you off but i think maybe we should address the opening statements before we start going into priori knowledge which is what you're referencing with be talking about recollection with the slave boy i'd really like to open up with the actual opening question of what is virtue and is this something that can be taught if that's okay with you right yeah that's uh, i was just trying to to frame the question there i guess with with like a little bit of quote but yeah that i mean that's that's i guess what i wanted to get into was was the question of with this kind of guiding through the slave boy i mean do do we think that virtue can be taught at all or kind of what's going on there it's difficult for us to say whether or not before i read this text and i very very recently read this text because as you know i'm very new to the philosophy world so prior to me ever having read this text i was of the opinion that virtue is something that is learned through practice because as humans we're still not fully convinced of whether or not we have free will so what is virtue if we have no free will but i believe that we are a product of our environment so if a person is of the type that they're exemplifying certain virtues that is something that has been bestowed upon them by the environment in which they've lived in okay and 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 is that kind of speaking to the this kind of idea of that we do think that or at least socrates presents it we do think that virtue is something which is good and that good things are profitable and that then we would you know assume because there's uh things like wisdom and you know other things that exist within the soul that from there you need the guiding principle of of what's outside of you because if if it's something within the soul, then it has to always be profitable, right? At, at, at least as far as what he's saying later. I see what you're saying, but then you also have to remember that he, in a way, disproved himself with that statement by saying that virtue is the desire of things that are good, but what are goods? And does it matter how you came into contact with these goods? If you go about getting goods through unscrupulous means then that means it's not virtue it's vice as mino said but what is good and how is it defined by an individual so what's good for me might be absolutely terrible to you so how do we know what is virtue and it returns back to that original question right and i mean that's something that that socrates kind of talks about too right is that there there isn't anyone that does something wrong knowing that it is wrong when they're doing it it's it's always kind of a side effect of being misinformed right yes yeah so i mean the i guess i guess the question kind of sits then about if and and i think this is why it's important to to look at the section about learning right because he he essentially lays out that uh if virtue is something by knowledge then it can be taught 
but if it's if it's not something by knowledge if it's by something else then it has to be gained by other means which is why he brings in the recollection right see but at the same time if you really think about the recollection experiment that he conducted with the slave boy is that truly recollection or is that more of a passive teaching technique that is employed in certain parts of the world because you're not necessarily allowing the other party to come up with these answers themselves what you're doing is you're asking guiding questions and allowing them to pick the answer that they believe you will be more inclined to appreciate okay yeah so so you're talking about being leading questions rather than like exact recollection exactly Hmm. no no that's 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 interesting actually there seems like there's something going on within the person's head you know even if it is leading questions you know there there is a type of maybe critical thinking that's going on or some type of like trial and error do you think maybe that might be tied to what socrates is referring to with recollection then I'm not 100% certain I understand what you're meaning, but are you meaning that things are recollected through a process of trial and error? And if that is the point you're trying to make, what differentiates trial and error from just traditional learning versus recollection? Right, right. No, no. I'm saying what Socrates is referring to as recollection is actually just critical thinking and trial and error. I'd be inclined to agree with that statement. Okay. All right. That's... That's really interesting. Uh, Before you continue, if you don't mind me interrupting you real quick. Yeah, what's up? Is Remember, I'm going to read the direct quote from Menno in this section. Oh, Socrates, I used to be told before I knew you that you were always doubting yourself and making others doubt. And now you are casting your spells over me and I am simply bewitched and enchanted and at my wit's end. And if I may venture to make a jest upon you, you seem to me both in your appearance and in your power over others to be very like the flat torpedo fish who torpifies those who come near him and touch him, as you have now torpified me. And in response to this, Socrates says that he is, in fact, a lot like a torpedo fish because this torpor that he inflicts upon himself, this confusion, this lack of understanding, is something that he finds to be an attribute. However, after the thought experiment with the slave boy, he again likens himself to a torpor fish but the thing that i've noticed about this is that while like i said he's leading the slave boy through the question so he at no point is unsure of the answer would you say that's correct he the the slave boy or or he socrates Uh, he socrates is 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 unaware of the answer to the geometry question would you say that it is reasonable that he knew the answer to his own question Right, yeah. I think with that he did. And it's interesting. So if, if, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but if that is the case, he again likens himself to a torpedo fish after the thought experiment, knowing that he knew the answer the entire time and he was leading the slave boy through that thought experiment. Does that not show that he is himself aware that he is in no way, shape or form helping this boy recollect? this knowledge he knows that he is guiding him in this knowledge because he is himself not actually torpified like he said right yeah i mean i definitely think that socrates knows more than what he's letting on and and i think mino i think he understands that too though he he might not want to admit it but no because that section there where he kind of hearkens uh, socrates to being a, a torpedo fish is a, a dramatic shift in the dialogue at least in the way that they're talking to each other and when it comes to something like knowledge i think socrates gives a pretty good example of that towards the end when he starts talking about the statues of daedalus mm-hmm. and how one needs to tie down the statues to be able to to hold on to them and it's it's the same with knowledge right i mean that's what he's referring to is that with knowledge one needs to tie it down because it's it's a very fleeting thing it wants to run away and i think there's a danger there too which i think it's more subtextually he's trying to get at which is that if you're not willing to rattle the chains that that statue that that knowledge is tied down with you're going to be further away from what the truth may actually be because there's there's this idea right of the true opinion and then the truth itself because the truth itself is seems something i don't know transcendental something that we can't actually hold within ourselves i see what you're saying what a little bit off subject but what i find interesting is about your last statement is the 
part that Anitas plays in this as well, because as you know, Anitas is one of the main prosecutors who was responsible for Socrates being put to death. Right. And right. so in a way, this is being foreshadowed in this text mm-hmm. by Anitas telling Socrates, you need to be careful about how evil you speak about men, because he didn't understand that Socrates wasn't necessarily speaking evil about them. He was using them in illusion to make a point. Yeah, I mean, Socrates seems very uncaring about what people think of him. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, He's and, definitely a romper kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I think that might play into part of what makes him so powerful of a figure at that time. I mean, it, 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 literally just this, this ugly, bug-eyed man kind of walking around walking around the town square, bugging people. And it, it gave him a name. That's, I mean, that's why Mino went to him. Went to him to, to see if he knew what virtue was. And, uh, Do you think that maybe he approached Socrates as a challenge? Because as is kind of mentioned in the text, Mino mm-hmm. is a student of Georgias. So do you think that he was approaching Socrates with this question to maybe catch him off guard? Right. I, I mean, I think it could be, but I, I, I feel like the it, it seems far more curious to me than it does accusatory right at the beginning there i, I mean and i could be wrong i think i think what you're saying has has validity because i mean as much as socrates is known to be a torpedo fist he, he he's also known to be a wise man he's actually insightful yeah yeah and so to look at the beginning and and see right away how he kind of flips this around on Mino, gets asked a question, and then answers him in only only more questions. Uh, I, I think it shows what Socrates is trying to do, maybe more than it does what, what Mino is trying to do. I think, I think Socrates is trying to reach towards that transcendental truth, right? That, that truth that is ever fleeting and always escaping us. And for the first response to Mino that Socrates made... As you know, it's a very long and drawn out, like just Socrates is going on a tangent just about the Thessalians and the Hellens. Like, what do you think the purpose of that for? Do you, what the purpose of that was, do you think that he's trying to, in a way, confuse Mino so that way he can make his point the actual subject of the discussion? Or do you think he's just an old guy who just kind of wanders off on tangents? No, I mean, I mean, I think he's definitely... He's definitely trying to uh, probably uh, probably open the conversation in a way that he is more comfortable with. Because when he's talking about the Thessalians and the Hellens, I, I think it's really kind of leading up into what Gorgias was doing versus what he thinks an actual philosopher should be doing. Because uh, I, think, I think he sees Gorgias as more of a, a sophist than he does uh, a philosopher. I agree. He references that later in the text as well by saying that Gorgias doesn't necessarily teach virtue. He teaches speaking. He teaches young Athenian men how to speak at the court because that is how you get yourself noticed as you speak eloquently. That is what Gorgias was intended to do. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I think that's part of the issue that Socrates has with this idea of truth, right? Is if you If you speak to it as if it is true then you're blocking out all possibility that it could be wrong and that's and that's what i'm saying about being willing to to rattle the chains occasionally it's it's the ability to question oneself at a certain point so it, i can see that yeah yeah so if you if you can if you can rattle the chains on the truth that you have held down on that statue you know whether or not it's secure but you also recognize whether or not what's there is actually true that's interesting yeah so i guess uh, what i what i wonder then is with that, you know, he he's trying to figure out what exactly virtue is, and I I mean we don't really get a we don't yeah, really get a satisfactory answer towards the end. Uh, um, no, uh, because it's difficult. It's really difficult to find the container of a set of traits. Because like he goes on about how would you differentiate a bee and what makes them the same? Like what is shape versus triangle and circle and square like what is the shape definition but towards virtue does that make sense 
Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's that's kind of the big Both issue, and 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 something something that I think Socrates has pointed out, which which is good to bring up, is that there's this virtue with a capital V, this overarching virtue, the virtue, and that is the kingdom. And then you have these kind of different genuses and species underneath it, and that's what Mino is speaking to every time. Every time yes. he asks, it's and, and it's a great. Uh, it's a great little little bit there at the front where Mino, but where, where where Socrates essentially says, "Oh wow, Mino, here I was looking for one virtue, and you've presented me with a whole swarm of virtues." And that, I mean, that's and that's what you're referencing to with the bees, because then he goes straight into how there's a swarm of bees, but that overarching thing that makes a bee a bee. And exactly because his problem with Mino is that every single time he brings it back up, now tell me what is virtue? All mm-hmm. Mino does is he grabs a handful of these virtues that he's already named Socrates, and he says these are virtue. It's like no, these are virtues. Right. I want to know what virtue is. Right. And that's, it's actually interesting. I, I, I want to see what you think, but I was wondering about, you know, you brought up the, the bees and kind of this, this idea of the swarm of virtues. And it was, it was actually making me wonder. So there's the, the bit where Mino first presents the different types of virtues. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's interesting. Cause, so the word that when Socrates was responding, like he says, you've given me this swarm of virtue. It seems to me, at least anything, a great fortune has been proclaimed, uh, Mino, that in fact, in seeking one virtue, I have discovered a hive or a swarm. And... Then he goes on to to compare this to to the type of bees, like we like we were talking about all these different type of bees, and yet we still call them all bees. So by what do we call them bees? What what is that overarching thing? I'm wondering if if perhaps he's trying to answer the questions here. If if Socrates is and trying to like you were saying, give those leading questions to bring Mino to the answer. I think you're right. I think Socrates knows more than he's letting on. And I'm wondering if he's looking at bees specifically because they're they're a purely ethical species, right? They live purely for the hive they they do everything for the hive they all have a certain distinct purpose a certain distinct virtue but the overarching perhaps the the capital v virtue is that they are for the hive and i'm wondering if, if you think maybe that's what socrates is trying to get at uh with what you're saying i'm actually drawing more parallels to with what mino is saying because at the beginning of the dialogue mino in his definition said that every man woman child slave mm-hmm. anything that anything on the planet really has its own defined set of virtue yeah so what is virtuous for a bee is not necessarily virtuous for myself so mm-hmm. we're not necessarily delving into what is that virtue we're more we're not really defining it we're just kind of setting out more attributes which was socrates's large complaint against mino is that he's listing attributes and not the definition right well and that's and that's that's an interesting point so yeah i guess i guess then we we'd have to ask what if if we're if we're trying to follow this train of logic what is it specifically that all bees and all people are doing when they're when they're kind of presenting these attributes is there perhaps a greater good that is being played in here is 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 that perhaps it the the striving for a a certain type of betterment you know in in whatever way that might be so that's very similar to what socrates said in his conclusion at the end of the dialogue that we don't know what virtue is so we can't really answer whether or not it's taught or if it's practiced or both Mm -hmm. But what we can agree on at this point, according to Socrates, is that in some way, shape or form, God is the one who bestows that virtue upon the virtuous. Right. Is that kind of what you're getting at here with some greater force? Like it doesn't have to be God. It could be just the universe or some unseen mover who is connecting all these pieces. It, it, It seems like some type of maybe even a necessity of some type, some something that that drives forward rather than backwards or or halting something in its place it it drives the individual themselves but also the entirety of the species and the entirety of the universe in which we live in there's a certain good whatever that good may be that seems to be 
being drawn towards. I can see what you're saying, that there's the innate instinct in each living person and being to be good. Mm -hmm. Like what you're saying is kind of from default, we want to do good, not necessarily evil. And that is in itself virtue. Am I catching your meaning correctly? Yeah, to build up towards this common good. And also then I think he's he's answering something else there right by how he's presenting it so it's it's both answering his own question and then also answering mino's question because mino's question of whether or not it can be taught you know he's giving a different explanation of how to teach the one flaw i'm kind of seeing in your logic though is we both agree they're completely non-virtuous people out there right yeah so if that is the case and every person is born with an innate virtue, what is the process in which we lose that virtue? I don't I don't know if it's a question of losing the virtue so much as we have to recall it first. We ha- we have to understand what it is first. And and that's the issue cuz going back to like him saying that this is an important point maybe we should have hung out a little bit longer, but the the question of does anyone do anything knowing that it is bad? Do they do things that are bad because they know it is bad or because they are mistaken and think it is good? I want to say that people do have an awareness on whether or not what they're doing. Obviously, this is a case-by-case basis. But that's kind of the issue is that, and Socrates kind of brings this up, is is that there is some type of good that that person who does bad thinks is for a good. So if you have if you have someone who steals, you know, we, we, we can say that if we're understanding stealing to be bad, then when a person steals, do they steal and say, I am doing bad and I'm doing it because it is bad? Or is it that they're mistaken with what is good? They think, well, here I'm stealing and it's going to help me because now I'm going to have this thing that I need or that, that I want. Say even a, a, a young child, right, starving on the streets, and he steals a loaf of bread. This is for him to survive, right? Yeah, I see what you're saying with the ends justify the means. I mean, I'm not even sure if it's it, it's a question of like that kind of utilitarian idea of like the ends justifying the means. It's just a question of what is the person who is doing this? What is their purpose? What is, what is their idea behind this? And I think like when we look at it, no one does something and says, I'm doing this because I know it's bad. True. They say, I know that this will lead to what I think is good. True, but, but let me counter that argument with this question. Knowing how very important justice the virtue of justice was to the ancient greeks how flexible do you think that this virtue would be that we can argue that a person who is doing evil knowing that is evil in the pursuit of good how flexible is justice that that would either be allowed or disallowed can you expand on that a little bit more like what i'm saying is like by knowingly committing evil even though you are in the pursuit of good you have already violated justice which to the ancient greeks justice is what they built their entire civilization on right so how flexible do you think they saw the virtue of justice during this argument do you think that justice can maybe be relaxed if i'm doing something bad like stealing food for my family i think at that point it's still just a question of what true justice is is like it's i don't think socrates is arguing that the only point or or that the only time someone can be mistaken is when it comes to virtue it can be when it comes to anything so a person can be mistaken when it comes to justice or virtue or any of these well essentially anything the person can be mistaken when it comes to anything and that they will act as if they are correct because they believe that they are right of right opinion yeah exactly and just because you are in that idea of right opinion doesn't mean that you're holding on to what is actually true so could we say that virtue is the possession of right opinion that's interesting maybe ah that's that's... that that takes elements from both gorgias's argument through mino and as Mm -hmm. well as sock because if virtue is something that is different for each and every person mm-hmm. like not necessarily like man woman child because all of these virtues are kind of interchangeable but what i guess i'm trying to say is that if virtue isn't a static thing uh-huh. then maybe we do set our own virtues well yeah i don't know and finding our own correct opinion yeah is i don't the process of finding our virtues 
Yeah, I don't I don't know though if that's quite it. Like I, I, I feel like Socrates is trying to get at that there is a virtue. There there is a thing that is virtue. But it's just something that we can't necessarily grasp. It just just that there there are multiple different ideal forms of different things so you you have the ideal form of virtue or justice or a tree or a man and there is an ideal form of that but everything that we see around us everything that we experience is something that is just slightly separated from that something that 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 we can only see a, a shadow of what is actually true so we when we understand virtue or justice it's only a shadow of what it actually is the form itself that that kind of like transcendental thing the true essence is something that's separate from what our understanding of it is and that's why i'm saying it's so important to question yourself constantly when it comes to these things is because we necessarily are separate from that See what you mean and would you say that this is exactly what Mino was talking about when he brings up his paradox which is we cannot go forth and look for the definition of virtue because we don't know what virtue is so we don't know where to start looking and if someone knows what virtue is they don't necessarily know because they have no reason to go out and learn about it this right I mean I, I I think Socrates does a good job of talking back that argument we can look for something still not knowing what it is because there there's a separation between us but it doesn't mean that we can't see parts of it and understand that and I, I think a lot of that is tied to Socrates idea of recollection you know and and when we look at the slave boy and we see him being guided through with these I mean, leading questions, you know, if if we're accepting them as leading questions and we see him being guided through with these, we see he gets closer and closer, even though he doesn't know exactly what it is he's looking for. My critique of the priori knowledge theory is because if we are, in fact, in possession of an immortal soul, like Socrates, Plato, State, then how are we to know that we possess this knowledge within our immortal soul? Is knowledge just something that's statically a part of every living human? Or because if none of my past lives or however it works have come into contact with this knowledge, how am I going to recollect such knowledge? And is this knowledge, if I've never come into contact with it, how do I go about learning it? That's my problem with the priori knowledge theory. Right. Well, I, I think what he's getting at is that knowledge and truth are something that are separate. He, he admits that knowledge can be taught. Knowledge can be taught. But that truth is something that's separate from that. So, so because that's what, that's what Gorgias is doing, right? Gorgias is, is teaching knowledge. But whether or not it's true knowledge is something separate. So so when it comes to, to recollection, the only way that we can really... Because the slave boy, right, when he thinks that he solved the issue of the square, he thinks he is correct. He holds that opinion, but it turns out to be a false opinion. And I think it's the same way. But every time, he moves slightly closer. So like if we look at understanding as a spectrum rather than as a true-false dichotomy, then it becomes a little bit closer to what I think Socrates is trying to get at. So I think a good example is if, if you hold out your hand in front of you and hold it open, that would be perception. And then if you close your fingers slightly, then that would be a type of understanding and a little bit more and that would be opinion and then if you finally close your hand and then grasp it with your other one then that would be kind of as close as you can get which is knowledge but you know that that's separate from truth still so knowledge is as, as close as you can get to truth but there is false knowledge and true knowledge and 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 that's based on whether or not it's aligned with what is actual so I mean when it, when it comes when it comes to something like that I mean I think I think you were right in saying earlier that something like knowing what virtue is is difficult. <laughs> yes, that's that's why we've reached the impasse that we're at with this discussion and why this discussion has eluded philosophers for centuries is what is virtue? It's such an abstract term to us that we don't quite understand it. Yeah, and I don't know if that's uh that's something that we we necessarily can know it's something where like the slave boy we have to just kind of 
try. We we have to we have to try, and we have to fail. What's funny about that is is that what he was looking for, what what slave boy was inevitably looking for, was something that was completely irrational. It was an irrational line. And what does that say possibly about virtue? That that virtue may be something that is irrational, something that cannot be comprehended. I'm wondering if maybe that irrationality, the irrationality of the line and the irrationality or possible irrationality of virtue, what that means for us as people, as these weird little creatures that are trying to run around and figure out the world. If the truth is something, especially the truth of virtue, is something that is completely elusive to us, what does that mean for us? Okay, so if you'll allow me to go a little bit off topic, I kind of mentioned this earlier in the podcast, but how can we find the definition of virtue and characteristics that are in striving for good or whatever it may be how can we know any of this if we in fact have no free will because as i was kind of mentioning earlier the problem with this is if we are just a matter of fact being created from our environment if your personality if your desires and everything is just created by a system of electrical impulses in your brain in response to stimuli from an outside environment can we say that anyone is truly virtuous i mean i think it i think it ties to your earlier question which was like i mean it was a reference to you bringing up mino's question you know if we don't know what we're looking for how can we look for it and maybe that's it is that we know when we see virtue we we see a a fireman run into a burning building to save uh some children uh, and 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 we know that's virtue We, we we understand it to be for for whatever reason we may not be able to define why that is virtue but we do understand it to be virtue at the very least. So I, I, I mean, I think we can understand and perceive virtue, but it may be an issue with defining. Can, can we agree that a virtue is a characteristic or a trait that is in benefit for the greater collective of mankind? Well, yeah, I, I mean, and that, that that's why I think, you know, I was trying to, to unpack with the question of the bees, you know, a perfectly ethical species completely working for the collective. And that would make at least to me, it, it makes sense. But maybe those chains need to be rattled. Maybe what I'm thinking virtue might be may or may not be correct. I don't know. Is that what you're thinking now? That virtue may be that, that purely ethical thing? I gotta say, I'm in the same boat as Socrates. I have no idea. I just kind of... <laughs> All I've been trying to do is kind of send out little like random thoughts, random ideas to kind of spark the conversation. But really getting down to it, I have no idea what virtue is. And I don't think anyone alive has any idea of what virtue truly is. Like it's something that we can observe, like you Mm. mentioned, but to truly grasp and see and say to yourself, this is virtuous because of X, Y, and Z. It's very, very difficult because as we've already ascertained, virtue in itself is a very abstract thought. It's a very abstract idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, I wonder with that, though, you know, virtue being an abstract thought and with us not being able to attain it, is it possible that, that we are closer now than maybe we we had been in the past or or you know in some way has there been movement towards virtue with the questioning of it with the attempts to tie down this statute uh has has there been any movement towards it or are we still just as lost as we have been I feel that we could easily say we're just as lost from where we began. Because if you look Mm -hmm. at society today, are we any more virtuous than they were way back when? A lot of people in the population would argue that in a way we've lost a lot of the virtues that once made us very down to earth, I guess. Because now technology Mm -hmm. allows us to do things you have, I don't know, things on the internet that you have access to, like pornography, things that... You could look at and say easily that's not a virtuous behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. So I guess maybe that ties back to what Mino was saying, where there are certain things that aren't virtues but vices. And it's interesting because, yeah, Socrates kind of pulls out this notion that Mino brings up of uh, virtue needing to be the that which leads to good and therefore that which leads to some type of profitable nature and uh, i'm wondering is the profitable 
Socrates kind of mentions that the profitable nature might be something that requires wisdom of some type. So so that virtue uh, must have something to do with wisdom. Yeah. Be it either spiritual wisdom or mental wisdom. Yeah, I can see that. It's a very large blanket statement that mm -hmm. kind of contains... But I can't help but feeling that it could be broken down more. And this is probably where Socrates left it at, is this is the closest we can get in our current understanding. Yeah, because, I mean, that's that's kind of the conclusion that is come to. You brought it up earlier, that, that virtue is um, a gift of the gods, and that it, it, we can never be certain of the truth with that before we ask you know, how this virtue is given. We, we can't be sure of the truth of virtue without understanding exactly what the virtue is. And that is really where he ends it, which, which is dissatisfying and unfortunate that he ends it saying that we don't know and perhaps can't know exactly what virtue is, but that it is by chance or by the gods that we receive it and can understand it, that we can fall into false knowledge and false opinion also by chance or by the gods. That might be a good place to uh, end for our first episode. I want to thank everyone for stopping in for our little conversation. I personally found it very enjoyable, very informative. I hope you did too. Please look forward and we'll look forward to speaking next time. We'll be talking about another Plato's Dialogues, the Gorgias, in which we're going to approach Mino's original tutor, Gorgias, and see what he has to say to Socrates. I do want to ask you to think about what do you think virtue is, and what do you think learning is? Uh, this is uh, Bearded Philosophy, and uh, thank you for stopping by. Have a great day. <laughs>